All right, here we are. A couple minutes late here, but we're back on Gambler Small Talk. <clears throat> really excited to talk to our guest um, this week. We have Chris Moss from the the excellent Lisk Long Island Serial Killer Podcast. Let's see if we could invite our buddy Chris. All right. Hope everybody had a good week. <sighs> I was rushing to get back in front of my computer, so I'm a little out of breath. And hopefully Chris will be joining us soon. Oh, here, here's our friend. All right, let's get him in. Should be joining us any second here. There he is. Hey, buddy. Hey, man, how are you? How you doing? Thank you so much for doing this, man. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, look, I wonder, is it possible for me to turn on my earbuds is that i do that without screwing this up Pro i would think so we can let's give try it, a it. Shot. should we try it sure if we have feedback we'll just adjust how's that how's that you can you hear That's me good, good? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Do I have to have it? Okay. So yeah, straight up and <laughs> down. Get... Is that the best way to do it? Yeah. Let's get your face in there a little bit more if possible. All right. We can do that. <laughs> no, that's not going to work. <laughs> I did it. I did a test run with this. There you go. That's perfect. How's that? Beautiful. Uh oh. I did a test run, but it, uh, my daughter tried to help me. <laughs> Well, you got it. You got it. Um, looking good, man. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining me. I know we've been we've been talking on and off for a few months, uh, mostly via email, a couple of phone calls. And um, I think this is, uh, you know, I always talk about we, um, you know, we're a band. We just put our, our record out last uh, last month on the 25th. And with no shows being, you know, available to play, we're trying to come up with these different things of just different ways to kind of get the word out. And a, a lot of that is just through conventional means, like nowadays anyway, like Spotify, YouTube, music videos, stuff like that. But um, we kind of had a discussion internally and we came up with the, the concept of doing a, a live stream series. And I didn't want it to be just like, you know, us playing songs. It's like, you know, been I, I feel like we have like live stream fatigue at this point six months into quarantine as musicians so we wanted to do something different and the idea of this interview series came up so um yeah man can't thank you enough for doing it um i figured we'd you start bet. um it's funny i i had i had one way i wanted to start and then uh today we had another john ray press conference well i'm not sure if you if you saw that I didn't watch it, but I heard about it. Yeah, he's basically just calling for um, them to, you know, make the Shannon's tape available to the public. Um, yeah. You know, of course, he's he's heard it, and you know, you guys discussed that at length on um, on your show. Um, but I I would obviously I'd love for that to be released. Um, you know, he not to get into the case right off the bat, but it, it was just, it was just so crazy. I'm like, what are the chances that the day we we're going to do this? Something came out. I know when you talk to Rachel and, uh, and Josh, um, Valerie, Valerie Mack had just been identified. It, it feels like, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Well, how things happen. I'll be honest. I told John Ray to go ahead and do something since I was going to be on tonight. 
No. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I was like, John Ray, look, I'm getting on with Mike. I, I just, I, we need a splash, <laughs> throw a press conference. Um, John Ray does love a good press conference. So he, he probably would have done it. But I, <laughs> He would have been like, all right, man, I, I'm, I'm all about the cause. Yeah. Um, now, well, where are you in Massapequa? Yes. Yes. I am out in my Airstream, um, which is now my office. Light's not great. I don't do much at night. You know, by this time I'm usually in. So I hope this light works and the AC's on. So I might turn the AC off. It's still 90 something down here in Austin, which is awesome. Austin is, uh, is the new hotspot, man. Like everybody's literally. Moving. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Um, well, cool, man. I figured, uh, I wanted to kind of start by, you know, before we got, get right into the case, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of talk about how you got involved in, you know, the business in general, um, you know, the entertainment business as, as a TV producer, writer, um, you sure. know, I've seen you around and I've seen you given a few interviews, but I, I don't think people have heard that yet. Would you mind kind of speaking to that a little bit? Yeah. Well, first, just cause I'm going to turn the AC off. I'll give you a little quick tour of the office. My office. Oh, um, so anyway, your question was how I got started in this business. I'm here. You're here. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. The question was how I got started in this business. Yeah. Yes. Well, golly, that goes way back. I'm probably older than you. Um, so I've always loved comedy, actually, and uh, performing and writing. But I grew up in Arkansas, in the sticks, where you didn't do a lot of that. Right. Um, and so I didn't really think it was something I'd pursue in high school. You're either like a jock or, and I played some sports. But when I got out of, when I got out of high school, I started making short films with a buddy of mine. That's awesome. That I grew up with. Yeah. And uh, we're still friends today. Good guy. So we started making films. And, um, but when I was finishing my degree, I was like, well, you don't get, you don't get like a film degree. That's just stupid. <laughs> so I ended up getting a degree in politics. Me too, and, man. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. I did that with teaching. Um, what were you going to do, law school, or what were you thinking? I did political science, and then, like, I don't know, man. I, I, I thought that was how I was going to go, and then I was like, let me just be a broke musician instead, so. Yeah, I, I, I that's kind of what I did. I mean, not the musician <laughs> part, but I, I did po political science at University of Texas, and then I was like, let's, let's teach, because yeah. that was, a, you know, that seems safe, and then I can keep making films, and then so... As I was teaching, we were still making films and we made our first feature. Oh, shit. And uh, yeah, all on our own using students and teachers and it's called Chalk. It's been, gosh, I guess it's been 20 years, 20-ish years. Wow. And uh, so we made this feature and it started getting into festivals and it did really well. Amazing. And um, yeah, I was like, wow, that's great. And it landed us a uh a gig at universal wow holy shit yeah i know and i just thought that's how it worked right you made some <laughs> yeah. crazy independent film and then one of the producers on the lot at universal's like hey come come write a film for us i was like sure so they'd have to fly us out first class and put us up and wow. um and then that deal that deal kind of fell apart. You know, there's a lot of movies that get worked on, but don't, well, most movies, right. 90% get worked on and don't get made. And then we also had a TV deal that we were shopping based on our film. And wow. 
the writer's strike hit mm. back in the day. Uh, and so that kind of knocked that out of the water. And then, so that's kind of how I got my start, but that didn't really go anywhere. And then I started working with a couple of other, other buddies who were writers and we formed this trio of screenwriters. And then we started working on scripts and sold our first one to Warner's. Um, we had written one, that one didn't get a lot of traction. Our second one made the blacklist, which is a big deal for screenwriting. And then uh, Warner Brothers bought. Holy and, shit. Yeah, it was great. And then Cameron Diaz attached to it and then unattached. And Whoa. it's funny. In this business, you think, oh, I made it. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you get a great gig at the bar you've always wanted to play in, and you're like, done. And you're like, no, we're right. supposed to, we still got to work at it. Yeah, so oh, yeah. It, you know how it is. So, yeah, it, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so, so, that, so that got us a gig doing, you know, so we waited for that to get made and chased other work and wrote other scripts and did a bunch of rewrites for studios. And, um, and it's a, it's a roller coaster ride, you know, especially when you have young kids and you're married and you're like, oh gosh, how long do I keep this up? I know. And we'd actually moved to LA for a while. Then we were back in Austin and I was like, man, I, I think I'm ready to be off this roller coaster ride of writing, chasing work, you know, yeah. cause it's a blast when the work's coming in and right. you know, if you're not the flavor of the year, then you're like, oh Lord. Yeah. And so I was like, what am I going to do next? And uh, I ran into an old buddy of mine who was working at a production company in town that does a lot of like uh, uh, reality kind of stuff, you know, non-scripted stuff. Yeah. And he's like, have you ever thought about working in reality TV? And I was like, yeah, it'd be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and so we, this company had this show on A&E called Shipping Wars. I remember and, that. Yeah, so I worked on, so they wanted punch up for it. They wanted it to be funnier. Okay. And I thought, well, this would be a side gig at least, you know, and I can stay in writing. And then um, I'll try to wrap this up. But so, yeah, so then. No, man, please. This is this is what it's all about, talking about, you know, I mean, because people need to know this stuff, right? Because yeah. Because like you said, people think it's just, hey, you moved to L.A. or you moved to New York and things happen and it's like you know even when you've had success like you've had it's still a fucking roller coaster and people need to be aware of that because you know my thing is you know everybody and we talked about this on a previous episode but it's so true everybody consumes art everybody has their favorite show everybody has their favorite song but a lot of times the appreciation kind of you, you don't make the connection that there's human beings behind bringing something to a screen or bringing something to the radio and the process behind. In, in our society. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. It's true. Right. And um, yeah. So just, to wrap my story up, which is the same company I'm at today, that I went into for this job, and they're like, "Well, it's grown into a full time gig. We want you to be on the show to write and and help bring new storylines to this hit we had called Shipping Wars." And so that's where I started, and I started writing, producing, directing traveling all over and helping make this show happen. And then we did like 76 episodes. Wow. And from there I became the company's uh, staff writer. And that's been going on eight years. Um, now this is outside of the production company that Mopac Audio is a part of or Mopac Audio is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's a good question. So, so basically, M Megalomedia is, right. the, is the company I work for in Austin. And we started a podcast company called Mopac Audio. Right. And so when we started that, I was like, I want to work in podcasts for a while. And since I kind of had the seniority and stuff, I jumped over and have been working in that. But Lisk started as a TV series and is still hopefully going to be a TV series one day. But 
basically I took the audio from that and made this podcast. Yeah, I mean, that's a great transition. Uh, I did want to speak about that because, um, you know, I, and I, I've said this to you a number of times, but the, the, the Lisk podcast is far and away, in my opinion, the best piece of media that's been done um, on the case. And I, I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit about how it initially was a TV show and then sort of transitioning into the podcast. And then, like you said, hopefully it becomes a TV show again at some point. I know on your um, on one of the episodes that you guys did with Bob Kolker, um, he said, you know, I, I could I could see Lost Girls kind of being um, a series at some point, you know. So I don't know, maybe even you guys hook up down the road. That would be great. But um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that's a man. It started years ago now. Yeah. But somehow our boss at Megalomedia got onto this story about Lisk, um, you know, the Long Island serial killer. And um, he wanted to make it into a series and he'd been talking to A&E. I think it was A&E. One of the networks about selling it as a series and then some other stuff had come out. And so me and a guy I knew that has come and worked for our company a few times, we started working on it. And that led us up to your neck of the woods up in Massapequa. And um, yeah, so we started putting all this media together and, and hunting down people and making these friendships, you know, and it just like finding um, Melissa Bartholomew, you know, her sister, Amanda Funderburg, who hasn't done many interviews, you know, we'd reached out to her and we'd reached out to her and, and we were like, ah, how, we're, we're about to go on this big East Coast trip through New York, take the ferry over to Connecticut, go up to Maine, cut over to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And I said, let's reach to her out on Facebook. And then she got back to us. And wow. it, you know, so there was a lot of work in that and in, in putting it together. And, um, and, you know, as, as you know, there's been some other stuff made about it. Some of it I dig, some of it I don't dig, but yeah, it's kind of hurt. It's yeah, it's kind of hurt us in the market a little bit because, you know, some of the networks are like, well, we need something big and splashy to make it again. Like the killer. And I'm like, yeah, we'd love to name the killer. That would be awesome. Sure. Um, so that's that's where it kind of stalled out as we're waiting on you know, how to, how to wrap up the back end of the series, you know, what kind of ending do we put on it? If it's not, of course, catching the killer, which that's our number one choice, right. um, but often not the case. Yeah. And so I was, I, because of this case and other cases, I became a big true crime, you know, fan. And I was, you know, talking to some of the, the powers that be and I was like look we've got this amazing audio we should you know we should use it yeah um and like I said that's how it turned into the podcast but that's it initially started as this tv series that you know we're still working on and hopefully get to finish um but it's hard you know you know you know the story better than anyone pretty much but it's hard to get like you know talking to SCPD Old Suffolk County Police, they don't want to talk much. And so it's hard to get that whole side of the story. But we're still working on it and trying to figure out how to finish the series. And, of course, get into season two of the podcast. Well, that's that's great to hear. So the fact that some of the audio is already out as a podcast is not going to uh, stop the, the the potential TV show from coming out. You could still do both is what you're saying? Absolutely. That, that has okay. been a question that has come up with internally and mm. it actually helps the TV show when you mm. can have, you know, like, have you, have you listened to that uh, Dear John podcast? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a perfect example. Yeah. So that came out as a TV series, you know, I mean, that yeah. actually helped it become a TV series. So, very good um, it only helps really it, it just raises awareness and um, 
so yeah, it doesn't hurt it coming out as a TV series. It's just, you know, working out with everyone involved what this ending looks like. Yeah, and, um, you know, as, I, as I've said many times in the past, and I just said earlier, um, it's not just my opinion that you guys are the best. Um, you know, John Ray said it, and Bob Colker also said it on both of their interviews on your show um, in so many words, you know, as far as the detail and obviously the level of care that went into it. There's a lot of real um, haphazard uh, jobs that have been done out there by, by people who have tried to tackle the subject. So we all appreciate that. Um, Thank you. Thank I want you. I really, I really of, it means uh, a lot. Well, I mean, it means a lot to, to me and, and I know a lot of others that, that you have taken the time and the care that you have, that you've done with this case. So um, honestly, it's, it's kind of mind blowing. I, I've told you this on the phone, but when I found your show, um, I was even a little skeptical, you know, but then I listened to the trailer and then I listened to the first couple episodes and my, my jaw was on the floor. My mind was totally blown. I was like, holy shit. Like these guys have, they fucking are killing it right now. Um, so, I mean, with, with that said, I guess I'd like to kind of, um, jump into things a little bit as, as far as the case goes and, and, you know, depending on how we are on time, I don't know how much time you have tonight, but maybe we could, um, uh, well, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I'm just always mindful of the clock because Instagram throws us off at a certain point. Um, but I had a couple sure. of, uh, I had a couple of questions, uh, cause I, I went back and re-listened to the entire series, um, in the time that, that, uh, you were confirmed as a guest. Um, and there were a couple of things that jumped out to me that I just thought are, I want to explore a little bit and it's not your typical, like, let's go blow by blow through what happened in the case. I think that's been done enough at this point. Um, but so I, I'm just going to go through a couple of things, if you don't mind. Um, sure. You know, something that talking about those those first couple episodes, so, something that you mentioned, um, something that you mentioned and also Bob Kolker, Bob Kolker make mention of is this idea of Michael Pack coming off as kind of shady in in not just in character, but also in person when you're around him. Um, I know that was your experience and it was also Bob's experience. I'll be honest, as a listener, uh, from, from just hearing him, a shady person. So uh, I was wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, you broke up a little bit, but I think you were saying when you were listening to him, did you say he came off shady when you were when you were listening to him on the podcast? No, I, I'm saying that I know that it was your experience that you found him to be shady, and Bob says the same thing. I didn't necessarily feel that from just hearing sure. his voice on the tape. Okay, I hear you. Yeah, you know, it, it is true. When I when I take out, <clears throat> when I remove being in the interview with him and sitting down in Brooklyn, wherever it was, and, and spending a couple hours with him, you know, he he can sound normal. And I don't think, I don't think Pac is a bad guy necessarily. I think he just, I don't know. I wish I could remember exactly how Colker expressed it because he did it very well. Colker is so good at kind of like, he'd be a great like political PR person because he can say stuff yeah. and not really say it. Um, but it's funny because I, I didn't think we really pulled a lot of punches with Pac on the episodes that, you know, where we just, you know, like the first and second episodes of, of the podcast. And he ended up writing us and was like, hey, I've been listening. It's great. And I was like, okay, that's great. <laughs> you know, so he, yeah. but I think that, I think that about him, right, that he is not that self-aware of how he comes off, of how he's viewed. And, you know, like, I'll just be honest. So a couple things that happened, like when you talk to him about the stories, right, about that night and about who Shannon was, you can tell he's like, uh, you know, this is my alibi. 
you know, he uses these weird terms. Like, I don't think I've ever had to be in a situation where I'm like, this is my alibi without someone, you know, and that's like, that's not even asking him what his alibi is. He just has these terms ready. And so I, you know, so there, there's a little bit of that. Um, just the way, you know, like seeing him and Pac interact was really weird. So, you know, Pac, that, sorry, Pac and Diaz interact. Diaz was Shannon's Diaz. boyfriend. Yeah. So we did their interviews together. And just the way they interact and, and just how he, he seems a little disconnected from his emotions sometimes, you know, when, when we're talking about Shannon and when we're talking about what happened and this weird lifestyle, I think he spent his life. I, you know, I don't know if that helps, but that's the yeah. vibe I pick up on. Well, there's also the issue um, of, you know, him saying that he sort of, quote, did all he can that night as far as looking for her, um, which just kind of appears to be a lie. Because um, the time, the timeline doesn't really make sense. Like, if he left before the police showed up, how is that doing everything you can when you're, you know, leaving the person you drove out an hour and a half somewhere in the complete dark? I guess maybe it was getting light at that point. Um, and also, you know, that whole thing about he saw Brewer smoking a cigarette on the ledge of the house, where if you look where his park, where his car must have been parked, he wouldn't have been able to see him from the other side. There's there's things about him that that for sure don't kind of add up. Um, but I was just curious to get a little bit more insight on on, on that because, like I said, just. He, he's pretty convincing if you don't know any better and you just hear him speaking. Like, I don't automatically go, oh, he's guilty of something or hiding something. Yeah, and it's weird because I'll go on um, your – let me just say this. If you're – in case, you know, if you're going to post later, I'd hate for it to be my side not coming through strong enough. Am I coming through okay? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'm you, you're breaking up quite a lot, honestly. Let me do a little quick Wi-Fi check here. Um, Let me check mine too while you're doing that, because maybe um, my Instagram's not sure. hooked up to Wi-Fi. Okay. Sure. Let's just do a little check. Looks like I'm all, I'm on here. So I'm, I'm hooked that... up to Wi-Fi, so I, sh I should be good on my side. How about you? I unhooked it from cellular data, so this has got to be Wi-Fi. Okay. I used to be on Instagram a little bit, but then I kind of just got off a lot of social media yeah and so i'm learning and i apologize no um, man you're doing you're doing great um and now i need to plug my phone in but do what you gotta do um yeah so pack oh that's not working can i do it can i do it like that or does that not work that doesn't work There you are. All right, you got me. I got you. Sorry about that. No problem. I really, um, I, I really did test this. <laughs> 